God has a unique relationship with water. Now, I'm not sure I can completely explain that to you, but I know it's true. In the very beginning in Genesis 1, we find that from the face of the waters, he conceived his creative idea of earth and man. For it said, and the spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. The word hovering there means to brood or to be relaxed. In that moment, creativity came out of him. Number two, from the womb of water, God births life. The range of percentage of water in our bodies is amazing. It ranges from adults at 60% all the way to infants at 75%. Number three, with a flood of water, God initiated a new beginning. For in 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 5, it said he wiped out with a flood, rescuing only eight people. Number four, from the healing waters, God restores life. John chapter 5 speaks of the pool of Bethesda and the stirring of the waters by the angels. And then number five, the very thing we're made of, water, is the very thing that we thirst for. John chapter four, Jesus said, everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again, but whoever drinks the water I give them will never thirst. This is just to mention a few. God has a unique connection with water. In 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse 20, the apostle said, For during the time of Noah, God patiently waited while the ark was being prepared. But only a few were brought safely through the floodwaters, a total of eight people. This was a prophetic picture of the immersion that now saves you. Not a bathing of the physical body, but rather response of a good conscience before God through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. This morning, for just a few minutes, as we prepare to baptize 21 people, I want to speak to you about the power of water baptism. Father, bless the reading of your word. And the ecclesia said, Amen. Amen. The importance of water baptism. Matthew 28, 19, therefore go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Please know that water baptism is not a personal choice for you to choose one way or the other. It's not a personal choice, but it's a commandment in the Great Commission to be baptized. So three things I'd like to share with you and hopefully stir your heart, and then we'll move into our baptismal service. But number one, you need to know that water baptism is the covenant seal of the New Testament. As circumcision was the covenant seal of the Old Testament, water baptism is the covenant seal of the New Testament. In the Old Testament, circumcision set Israel apart from the other nations on the earth. God said, they're mine. And as God would look and see a man circumcised, it would provoke his blessings on his life. In the New Testament, that covenant seal is water baptism. Colossians chapter 2 your whole self ruled by the flesh was put off when you were circumcised by Christ, having been buried with him in baptism, and which you were also raised with him through your faith and the working of God who raised him from the dead. So as much as circumcision in the Old Testament was a seal, water baptism is a seal in the New Testament. It's a circumcision of the heart, and it sets us apart from the nations of the earth. The blood of Jesus secures your salvation. Let that be said loud and clear. The blood of Jesus secures your salvation, but water baptism, this act of obedience, seals it. Water baptism does not save you. The blood of Jesus does, but water baptism is a seal upon your life in the New Testament as much as circumcision in the Old Testament. 
So you have to know that a true disciple, a follower of Christ, and please know what that's what that means. That word disciple means you are following Christ. A true disciple of Christ must begin with this first commandment in Matthew 28, 19. Be baptized in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. If you get that one wrong, you're off to a bad start. You've got to start there. The first thing after salvation is water baptism to seal this covenant relationship that you have with him. Number two, water baptism is a public confession of a personal covenant. Romans 6, 4. A, we were therefore buried with him through baptism and to death in order that B, just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too may live a new life. So please know this, that water baptism is an illustrated sermon. It's an illustrated sermon of salvation. It means the death and the burial to sin and the old way of life. When a man or a woman stands in this baptismal tank and they're taken down into the waters, it is a death and burial to sin and the old way of life. It's an illustrated sermon. But then when they're pulled up, it's a resurrection to a new way of living. To die to the old and be resurrected into the new. And it's my understanding that in the Muslim world, They'll tolerate people going to a Christian church. They'll tolerate church attendance. But the one thing they will not tolerate is a public water baptism. They won't do it because they understand what it means. Perhaps they understand it more than some Christians do. I say this because I want you to know that this is not a personal choice. Take it or leave it. This is a commandment in the Great Commission. And the church has to be careful that we recognize this ordinance of the church to recognize how important this is. True disciples follow the Lord and they follow the Lord into the river Jordan and his water baptism. If it was good enough for him, it's good enough for me. So we have to realize how important this is. This illustrated sermon, this public confession of a personal covenant. It sets us apart. You have to know that water baptism is the covenant sign, wedding ring, of your Christian relationship with Christ and the church. And that's important to me that you grab that. That you understand that as much as this ring is a covenant sign, it's a ring that was exchanged between Suzanne and I when we stood in the altar and we exchanged vows and we made a covenant with one another. This is a sign that I'm in relationship with my wife and I'm in a covenant relationship with her and I will keep myself only unto her. So is water baptism, a public confession of a private covenant. What would it say to my wife if I would not wear my wedding ring? What would it say of my wife if I wasn't willing to exchange vows with her in public? What does that say of a relationship? But the fact that I came to this altar and I gave my heart to the Lord, the fact that I came to this altar and I gave my heart to my wife, the fact that I put a ring on my finger and the fact that I went to a baptismal tank and was baptized, all of that is a public confession of a private covenant. It's important, guys. Do you sense me? Do you feel me this morning? This is so important that we make a public confession of a private covenant. Jesus even referred to the fact if we're ashamed of him in public, he'll be ashamed of us when he returns to planet earth. That's why we still give altar calls. And I understand that there's an argument and there's a debate about trying to make salvation easier. Let people just sign a card or go to a, a side room in private and, 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 and just do things that way. But let, let, me, let me tell you something. There's something about either raising a hand or getting up and walking up front publicly and saying, I want to be saved. And then taking them into a room where we can counsel with them and pray with them and give them some material. There's something about making this more public. Listen, salvation 
is so simple that even a child can receive it. But it's not something to be simplistic and hid in the back room that we're ashamed of. But to stand publicly and name the name of Christ. Public confession of a personal covenant. Number three. Water baptism is a ceremonial cleansing or purification. Now I say ceremonial. You have to know that though it might seem like a completely Gentile Christian practice, baptism of purification was a pre-existing part of Jewish religious tradition and culture before the time of Christ. Just two scriptures of, of several, but just two I can give you. Number one, Leviticus 14, eight. The person to be cleansed, a leper, must wash their clothes, shave off all their hair and bathe with water. Then they will be ceremonially, ceremonially clean. When a man or a woman was discovered to have leprosy, they had to go through this baptism of purification to cleanse themselves of that corruption. Mark chapter one, verse four, it said, John came baptizing. This is before Christ took his position on the stage. John came baptizing in the wilderness and preaching a baptism of repentance for the remission of sins. Before Jesus, the Jew understood the baptism of purification. The word baptism or baptizing here means to immerse, to overwhelm, to cleanse or wash by submerging. You see, we submerge. We submerge because it's a death and burial and a resurrection, but it's also a submerging. It's to be overwhelmed by the water. It's to be overwhelmed, to be cleansed and purified. It's a ceremonial thing, purified. The blood cleanses the sin, but this is a ceremonial cleansing. It's to cleanse and then you raise up clean and a new beginning. It's the baptism of purification. It means something. And John chapter three, verse five, Jesus answered Nicodemus' question, a religious man, what must I do to be a part of this thing, the kingdom of God? He said, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. Nicodemus would have associated these words of Jesus with John's baptism of repentance that you must be born of the water. You must repent for the remission of sins. You must be baptized for the remission of sins. You must be purified and cleansed and your spirit must come alive towards God. John the Baptist would surely, or excuse me, Nicodemus would associate those words of Christ with the baptism of John, of water and of the spirit. The baptism of repentance. It ceremonially cleanses you and purifies you of the works of the flesh. It's an act of obedient, obedience leading to a clear conscience. A clear conscience. How many remembers when you first got baptized? I remember. I remember being baptized and, and, and on a Sunday night, and I remember Brother Clinton baptizing me, and I remember coming up out of that water, and there was such a, a feeling I'm cleansed, and I'm, my conscience is clear towards God. I've done what he asked me to do. I've done what he commanded me to do. I've got a clear conscience. I've went to the altar. I've come into the water. I've come up out of the water. It's a new beginning for me. My conscience is clear towards God. All things are passed away. Behold, all things become new. I'm a new creature in Christ. It's a baptism of repentance. Psalms chapter 42, verse 1. As the deer pants for the water brook, so pants my soul for you, O God. Now, this is just food for thought. Something that just came to me as I was mulling over this message this morning. Back... This last November, November the 19th, my grandson, Jude, killed his, not his first buck, not his first deer, but his first mature buck. Now, this buck was probably, he looked to us probably five years old, maybe five and a half. And it was the first mature buck that Jude took. 
Now, he hit the, he hit the deer hard. Uh, in fact, out of all my years of, of hunting, I've never seen a deer throw that much blood in the, in the, at the point of contact like this deer did. He hit him hard. And he threw out a real strong blood trail for a couple of hundred yards in the woods. Now, we did what you do. We, we identified the blood. We waited 30 minutes to an hour, probably an hour before we started trailing him in the dark. And we got in the woods about 200 yards and I stopped and I said, Justin, we need to, we need to back off of this deer because he's not quitting. And the blood trail was starting to wear thin. So we quit and we left. That was a Saturday night. I had to come home. Justin and Jude stayed. And the next morning he got up and he called a guy that had a dog that would trail that deer. And he picked up the trail. And some time later, probably three, another 300 yards, they found the deer. Now, I tell you this because I want you to understand that when they found the deer, he had just crossed over that major creek we have on our deer lease. And, and when they got to him, his body was still warm. His, his legs were wet. His legs were wet. And his hindquarter had been chewed on by the coyotes. So we knew that through the night, those beasts of prey were on his trail and they were dogging him. And he ran to the creek to escape their trailing. They'll tell you that it's not uncommon for a deer when the enemy is on their trail to find water because it's in the water that you can lose their scent. It's in the water that you can lose, their, lose your scent and, get, and they'll get off your trail. And that's what this deer did. In Psalms chapter 42, some theologians believe that these words that David spoke as the deer panteth for the water brook, so panteth my soul for thee, O God, was spoken when he was running from his enemy. As Absalom and or Saul was trailing him, they're not sure which one, but as he was fleeing his enemy, he was longing for the waters to lose the scent so the enemy would get off of him. There's something about this that just captured me. This baptism of repentance. It's a ceremonial cleansing. It's a purification of the flesh, the works of the flesh. It's, it's an act of obedience with a clear conscience. It's, it's, a, it's a death, burial, and then a resurrection. The old things are passed away. Behold, all things become new. There's something about letting go of the past, about coming up out of that watery grave to say, I'm done with yesterday. I'm done with everything. I'm done with my past. I'm done with the works of the flesh. I'm done with the sin, the addictions. The, I'm done with it. And you see, you can cause the enemy to lose your scent by consecrating yourself in the waters of baptism. To throw, his, to throw the scent to where the enemy... The enemy just gets off your trail. Listen, there's something about consecrating your heart and your life to him. There is something about coming to a place where the enemy loses his sin of you, where the drugs ain't gonna work anymore. The adultery, that ain't gonna work anymore. He's committed himself. He's consecrated himself. He's gone down in the water grave. He's come up a new creation. There's something about this guy, this gal. They're, they're, they're on a new pathway now. Lose the scent. Lose the sin of the enemy. It doesn't mean he won't come back. But to lose this scent, get off my trail because my heart's been consecrated. Stephen, come help me. You see, when you look at water baptism, you have to ask the question, the why, the what, the when, and the how. The why be baptized? Because it's an act of obedience that seals a covenant. And it's a public confession of a personal covenant. What is the meaning of it? It's a symbol of death, burial to sin, an old way of life. It's a symbol of resurrection to a new way of living. And it's a symbol of consecration, causing the enemy to lose your scent. When to be baptized? As soon as possible following salvation. Because it says in Acts chapter 2, verse 41, those who believed on the day of Pentecost, those who believed the word that day, numbered 3,000. And they were all baptized and added to the church. This isn't something you have to put off. There's nothing, there's no, there is no scripture that tells you you have to wait a certain period of time. They have to prove yourself. 
On the day of Pentecost, they, were, they believed, they were saved, and they were baptized. So how to be baptized? We believe in immersion, being submerged. The word baptized means to immerse, to submerge, to overwhelm or make fully wet. So where does it leave us? Mark 16. Whoever believes the good news and is baptized will be saved. And whoever does not believe the good news will be condemned. The optimum word there is believe. To believe. To believe as a disciple and to follow after him even in water baptism. We're here to make disciples. You have to remember Technically, Jesus did not call us to make converts, to convert them. He called us to make disciples, to go into all the world and make disciples. And part of that making of a disciple is water baptism. Again, that there's a real mark of uh, a demarcation there. As I mentioned earlier, in the Muslim world, they, they, they don't mind so much if you convert to a Christian church and you attend a service. What they don't want you to do is become a disciple by getting baptized. That's the problem. Perhaps in America, we've lost the significance and the importance of water baptism. It doesn't save us. The blood does. But he makes it very clear here in Mark 16 that whosoever believes the good news and is baptized will be saved. We have to follow after the Lord in water baptism. There's an act of obedience there. And it's almost like if we fail at that first commandment, from then on out, there's a struggle. There has to be, as with exchanging rings with your wife, as exchanging vows, you have to make a public confession of a personal covenant. So, I can't explain it completely, but I know this. God has a unique connection to water, and it's time for you to be baptized.